Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good evening. Thanks so much for tuning in to our panel this evening uh, for Made in NYC Week 2020, Sustaining Our Local Food Supply Chains. Um, I'm Joanna Reynolds, the Manager of Programs and Partnerships for Made in NYC. And Made in NYC is a nonprofit local branding initiative that supports thousands of New York City's manufacturers and makers with marketing and branding services and building a sense of community. Uh, Made in NYC now has over 1,400 members and growing. So if your business is making a product in one of the five boroughs, you are most likely eligible for a free Made in NYC membership that gains you access to a plethora of tools, resources, and networks. Made in NYC is an initiative of the Pratt Center for Community Development, a community-driven planning and development organization that works for a more just and sustainable New York City. And the Pratt Center is a part of Pratt Institute. So to put this conversation in context a little bit, Made in NYC started in the aftermath of 9-11 as a way to engage New Yorkers to shop locally and to get local businesses to connect with each other in order to sustain local supply chains. Similar to the moment that we're in right now, it was a time when celebrating and uplifting New York City, its small businesses and communities was critically and essentially important. So today's Made in NYC Week theme is sustainable networks. Earlier th uh, this earlier today, we had a held a panel in partnership with Pratt Institute, uh, highlighting the stories of Pratt alumni who are now makers and manufacturers in New York City. And if you missed that conversation, it lives on our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, um, as does all content from Made in NYC Week, and that will continue to live so you can go back and catch up and watch anytime. Um, Made in NYC Week uh, 2020 is our time really to uplift the story and to tell the narrative of a resilient New York City and a just recovery spotlighting the manufacturers and makers who are essential to our local economy. Before I introduce our speakers tonight to talk about sustaining our food supply chains, I'd like to thank our Made in NYC Week sponsors. Uh, first off, a big thank you to the New York City Council who supports Made in NYC Week's work all year round. And then in addition, thank you to our Made in NYC Week sponsors, Square, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Uncommon Goods, Goldman Sachs, Cozen O'Connor, Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, Lisk NYC, TD Bank, Verizon, oh. City Point, Adafruit, Taproom, Outsnapped, and steady goods. So now I'd like to start the conversation and introduce our speakers. So please welcome Neil Patacone uh, from New York City's Make. Welcome Cole Riley from Founders Give and Winston Chu from Bombite. Um, let's, let's start it off. Um, and Neil, why don't you quickly introduce yourself to everyone, uh, where you work and, and what you do. Sure. Thanks a lot, Joanna. Um, my name is Neil Patacone. Uh, I work at the New York City Manufacturing and Industrial Innovation Council, uh, or MAIC, M-A-I-I-C, which is an industry partnership that's based at the Department of Small Business Services. Um, we work with manufacturers, uh, transportation, logistics, and distribution firms, and infrastructure service companies. Um, to strengthen the city's talent cha supply chains, our policy and regulatory frameworks, and also facilitate innovation um, and technology acquisition. But at the beginning of COVID, um, I worked with a number of my colleagues across city government, across a number of different agencies on uh, what was called the, the Food Czar Task Force. Um, when we realized that food supply chains were gonna be disrupted um, and people, vulnerable populations might not have access to food. Uh, we set up this, this interagency group of folks that worked on two major things. The first thing was actually getting meals to vulnerable populations that needed to stay home or that otherwise didn't have access to meals. And the other piece was understanding and securing the supply chain, both within New York City and understanding what might happen um, a little bit upstream where at the, uh, the source of it. So, um, Happy to get into some more details about that, um, but thanks again for having me. 
Great. Um, and next up, uh, Cole Riley, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell us who you are. Hey, yeah, I'm Cole Riley. I'm the president of Founders Give, and we are a hunger relief nonprofit here in New York. And what we're doing, we're bringing healthy and nutritious food directly to people's doors. And we were born out of the whole COVID peak, really March and April. We really kind of made our name and really, really got off the ground um, as the number one relief effort in the city over 10 weeks working with hospitals. And, you know, we engaged CPG manufacturers across the entire country, some of the biggest brands, some of the best emerging better for you brands, some of the small local brands um, and streamlined how they got their donations into the hands of frontline healthcare workers and patients at practically every hospital across the city. And since then, we have been really expanding our vision and looking at how do we disrupt this really outdated, inefficient food pantry model. We know we have so many manufacturers out there that are sitting on surplus product, sitting on short-coded product. They wanna find a home for it. They also wanna flex their muscle and, and show that they're a good company that wants to help the community. There just isn't a consistently easy way to do that. And on the other side, feeding communities is broken. It just really is. I think making people stand in line uh, for hours is the most inefficient way to do this. And what we're gonna be doing with our direct need model is plugging right into the supply chain of manufacturers where anything surplus or short coded we can take, we can effectively customize boxes and get them to families. And uh, and that's what we're gonna be all about. We're launching later this year with the pilot program. We're really excited about it. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to chat about what our plans are and how we can be a great resource for manufacturers that are sitting on extra product um, to be able to recycle it and make sure that it makes an impact. But I'm happy to be on this panel and talk about what our vision is. Great, thank you so much. I'm excited to hear more. Um, and uh, last but not least, Winston Chu, why don't you um, introduce yourself to, to everyone? Hi, Joanna, my name is Winston. I am the co-founder of Bombite. Um, I'm a New York-based entrepreneur. I wear actually many hats. Um, I have restaurants, um, a catering company, but also um, served as the co-founder of Rethink Food, which is a uh, local-based um, nonprofit that focused on rescuing excess food, um, which we pivoted in COVID to feed New Yorkers at the, in the time of need. Um, but majority of my specialty and, and time has been spent on um, securing local supply chain, understanding how supply chain um, is pivotal to to New York City as restaurants are suffering and people are, many people in New York City are um, in need of a meal right now. So um, my day to day has been just representing the industry um, within restaurants, catering, and also nonprofits, but most importantly, just representing New York City and understanding how during this time um, we can assist in getting food um, from farms down to um, people um, that need it the most. So I, I'm excited today to talk about, you know, my experience and what I've seen throughout um, that has shaken up the industry from the restaurant side, from the catering side, from the food industry side, but also understanding the work in which um, local nonprofits have facilitated in terms of feeding people at this time. Wonderful, thanks. Um, yeah, excited to talk more. We're we're gonna kick off. Um, when Neil is going to give us an overview of um, what what he's been working on and kind of where we are right now, how COVID impacted uh, our local supply chains, and sort of looking forward to what's next. So Neil, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to kick it off. Great, thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, the Food Czar Task Force had these two goals in mind. One was feeding folks and setting up a, basically an intelligence gathering system to understand everything that was going on throughout the country, throughout the world, and how that might um, implicate our food supply chains here in the five boroughs. Um, and so we quickly realized that there were, in fact, wasn't just one supply chain, wasn't, you know, that there were there were really two basic types of supply chains, and I'm going to share um, some graphics that might help us understand this. Um, oops. Let me know if. Uh,
Oops. Hey, I'm just popping in. I don't know. Um, we don't have your screen yet. Let us know if we can help. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Just a little uh, technical difficulties. Um, okay, well, we... Um, we're gonna uh, just wait a second um, until we get Neil back. Oh, there we go. I think he's back. Hey, sorry about that. Seems like my, uh, my screen froze there. Um, should I try and let me try that again? Yeah, let's let's get those graphics up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. There we go. It's, uh, visible. Right. Yeah, got it. Great. So um, you too. Excellent. Great. So with due credit to uh, localnexus.org, I um, took their some of the graphics off their site and uh, modified them a little bit. And so effectively, we basically have two different supply chains, one that effectively caters to supermarkets and home consumers, and the other one that caters to restaurants and institutions. Um, they're very similar. Um, you know, they all start at farms and processing facility, this is farms and factories. Um, go through to, to experience some sort of processing um, and packaging. From there, they're distributed to warehouses and then they're sold to supermarkets um, and then finally home consumers. But for the restaurant and institutional side, and by institutions, we mean things like museums, cafeterias and whatever it might be that, that serves lots of, lots of people. Um, the, it might be the same raw ingredient and it might be processed in similar ways but it's packaged. For example, um, you know, a, a, a household might buy a one, folks in this, in this supply chain might buy a, a one pound bag of cheese. Um, but folks on the restaurant side will probably be buying 10 or 20 pound bags of cheese. And so the, the point at which that diverges is right here at processing. Um, and so because it, it diverges so quickly right at processing, a lot of farms and producers um, actually have their own relationship directly with the processors, processing facilities. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, we have two supply chains, one for restaurants and institutions and another for home consumers and supermarkets. Um, and what happened very abruptly during COVID was basically that this whole side the downstream folks, the customers, the restaurants, the institutions suddenly closed, right? They all had to close down because of safety concerns or having to do with COVID. Um, and so what that meant was that all of these folks up here were basically sitting on surplus food. And you may have heard a lot about um, farmers having to throw out tens of thousands of eggs or you know, pour milk down the drain or um, plow over their cabbage because they didn't have any buyers. And you know everyone was just thinking, well, why don't you just give it to the people over here, <laughs> the home consumers? Why don't you just give it to the people um, in, in, uh, in food pantries? And the reality is that, it, that just by virtue of there being these two almost completely segregated supply chains, pivoting on a dime would just have been really difficult. Um, and so what was happening, meanwhile, was that folks here in the processing side were thinking, oh, but what if we just repackage things to send them over to this side? Um, 
But I think even the fact that there was so much uncertainty about COVID itself, the fact that, oh, we didn't know, is this going to last two weeks? Is this going to last two months? Is this going to last two years? It might not even make financial sense for the processors to change what they're doing um, if we're if in just a couple of weeks they would have to go back to their normal processes. Um, and so I think that's what a lot of us were dealing with um, downstream, you know, as consumers, um, that we saw this happening in the news and we thought, why can't we just get it to people that need them? And basically that's that's a big part of what we learned. Um, and another piece that we learned about basically every single part of the supply chain is that both the reason for the resiliency of every single piece and the way that it did function and also the most vulnerable part of each part of that supply chain was the people, the workforce. Um, I remember there was one point where one of the biggest distribution centers um, that provided you know, a large percentage of food to the city, within a couple of weeks of the shutdown, um, the, the, the workers said, you know, we don't have enough PPE and if we, if we don't, we're, we're, gonna sh we're just not gonna come to work. This isn't a safe place to work. And so it was really, and at the same time, the supply chain of, uh, of, of face masks and other protective equipment was also experiencing its own disruptions and hoarding and all that. Um, so I remember we had to we had to match them with a supplier really quickly in order to make, make sure that that warehouse stayed online. Um, and you know there were a handful of other um, interventions that that the city made in partnership with um, with food banks, with food pantries, with nonprofits, and and, and uh, folks like Cole and, and Winston. Um, but just to name a couple, uh, the first piece was, of course, because every single part of this supply chain was so reliant on uh, on their workforce. Um, probably the biggest vulnerability there was actually making it safe. And you know, looking here at this this cow here, we're <laughs> reminded of all the, the news that we heard about. Um, the slaughterhouses and, and huge industrial um, meat processing facilities having to, um, some of them having to, to shut down for a little while because it, the, the people were, were packed in so close. Um, but at the same time, the, the, uh, they also needed protection. So uh, to, to keep, to keep um, the supply of meat going. So yeah, PPE and getting protective equipment and safe, um, safe, safe, um, working situations and, and working uh, processes for everyone was a really, at every point of the supply chain was a really important part of, of maintaining its, uh, its resilience. Um, another piece of, another intervention we did was because there were so many disruptions in the supplier side um, and so much, so much excess and surplus food, uh, the city created a, a database called the Food Supply Match, which was, you know, if farmers up here, up, upstate or elsewhere, had surplus food that they couldn't send down to their restaurants, they could match it with institutions, um, institutions over here, um, just through use. It was sort of like a Craigslist or, or Tinder for um, for for food. Um, so one other piece. One other intervention was um, because trucks, this side, the distribution side, um, had a lot of concerns about entering a, a New York City. Um, and about 90% of our goods and freight come through truck on the, over the George Washington Bridge. Um, because a lot of them were afraid of entering the five boroughs because of the high rate of COVID infections, um, they had to have their own trust, truck rest areas that the city set up um, in Staten Island and also by Hunts Point. And then finally, I think there's a handful of other things, but one other one I'll mention is just kind of the public communication around all this. Um, I'm sure we all remember that, that paper towels and, and toilet paper kind of ran off the walls the first week or two. Um, and in the weeks after that, a lot of customers went to supermarkets and saw, hey, my meat is, you know, two, three, four, or five dollars more than it usually is. Are you supermarkets trying to price gouge? Um, and in some cases, that 
certainly was a case. Um, but in a lot of cases, it just had to do with the fact that, you know, huge um, meat processing facilities. And I think there's some like five facilities throughout the country that's re that are responsible for, for some 60% of the meat we consume. Um, some of those had to shut down. And so just by virtue of the laws of supply and demand, it, 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 uh, it ticked the prices up. So um, those were some of the interventions we made at that time. And those were some of the disruptions we experienced. Um, but in addition to that, we also, um, of course, set up the whole feeding operation. And um, I think Cole and Winston will talk a little bit more about that. So I'll, I'll wrap up now. Thanks so much, Neil, for that for that overview. That was great to learn about how the city engaged and sort of and all the, the interworkings of that. Um, I would like to bring all the speakers on, um, but let's, I'm gonna start uh, with Cole. Um, I know Founders Gift has been doing some really interesting work and you know, I think the theme of what the word that I think we're all sick of, but also still an important word is pivot, right? That everyone has pivoted in some way. Um, and I know that Founders Give uh, and the work that you did um, started as a different mission, a different organization. And I'd love, love to have um, you share with sort of what, what happened with Founders Give, how did it get formed and, and yeah. what are you doing? Absolutely. Real quick, Neil, that was great. I mean, I live around the Upper West Side, so that George Washington Bridge stat is like insane that most of the products moving through there. It makes sense. Um, so yeah, a little kind of background on Founders Give because it's really a, it's two stories. It's what we did in the spring and what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, before, I mean, going into March, I was running a company called Founders Market and I was working with a lot of local food brands doing film and TV work with them. Um, and that's how I kind of got embedded in this whole community here. And it really is a community of these either really small, like one man band operations or pretty sophisticated uh, CPG brand. Um, but it's local, still based here in New York, doing warehousing and production here in New York. So I knew a lot of these brands, but work had definitely dried up, you know, production work, everything stopped in March. And at the same time, you see hospitals in the news starting to surge, not just patients, but obviously the healthcare workers. And at the same time, a lot of companies wanted to donate. Now you saw a bunch of companies show up with meals, but when it came to products and getting from water bottles to cold brew to yogurts, there was a little bit of a disconnect. Um, it was hard for brands at that level, really, at that local New York level, to get somebody on the phone from Mount Sinai and say, hey, we got two cases of stuff we want to help out. You had to know a doctor. So you start adding up all these different brands across the city that had to pull back their field marketing, that were sitting on all this extra product they wanted to help. There wasn't an effective way to donate. So that's what we set up. I did that pivot. It was initially just kind of a pop-up quick thing where I'm gonna work with a bunch of these brands I know, I'm gonna set up warehousing, I'm gonna get some trucking, I'm gonna engage all these hospitals and be that one voice with all these donated products. And we can kind of customize it based on what the hospital is, how many people are in there, what do you guys are already receiving, what's the big need? And it started off as a very local initiative, working with a few hospitals and then exploded and got really, really, really big obviously along with the, the peak that we start started to see in April. So we went from local to working with national brands. I mean, Chobani and Kind and Nestle and Kellogg's. And we were hearing from companies all over the country of all sizes that donating products is tough for them. Um, it's tough, especially in like a targeted fashion like this, where they, they know who they want to feed. They want to get it there. Um, but there's like 20 different hospitals, you know, 17 different New York City health and hospitals. How do we get it all there? They needed to centralize it. So we really blew up and it was over 10 weeks. Um, we became the number one relief effort in terms of products moved. It was all CPG. It was mostly food and beverage, but also brought in partners like Bombas and Casper and a huge amount of product from Colgate. And we were really working with practically every single major hospital system in every facility, had two warehouses, trucking, and it was a big, big effort. Um, now the need had dissipated at the end of May um, and in the hospitals, and that's when we slowed it down. And then since then, that's where we've been thinking about the future. And that's when I kind of made the full pivot. I'm like, forget about doing film and TV work by, you know, I'm going to work. I think that there's an opportunity here where brands are sitting on a lot of product and there's communities that 
are still being plagued by this food insecurity crisis and it still hasn't been solved. And so, um, hold on one second, I got this thing. Just Can you hear me? Yes, there we you. can hear you. Cool. <laughs> so, so that's where I made that full pivot in, in May, June. And that's when we've been thinking about the future. Um, looking at the landscape, looking at this really kind of food pantry heavy model. Um, and we know the other federal and state programs out there. To me, it just it's very inefficient. And when we talk about sustainability, it's only a sustainable a solution, you know, whether it's a food pantry or something, if it's getting to the end user, if it's getting to a family and they're eating it, just being able to have a food pantry in a neighborhood and a place to dump a bunch of stuff, that a lot of that can be tossed as well. Or maybe families are taking a bunch of stuff and they that can be tossed. So being able to create a very direct relationship with families that also is customized directly exactly to what they need, that is how you create a really sustainable um, you know, nugget <laughs> or a sustainable organization that can plug into a supply chain and really make sure when we rescue food, it really gets rescued. It doesn't just end up in a pantry. Um, and then it requires families to wait in line for hours. So that was, you know, over these past few months, that's what we've been really harnessing and figuring out and learning from brands. What do they do? Where are they frustrated? How much product is out there? Was this just a result of COVID? There was this huge explosion of inventory just sitting around, or is this a persistent issue? And it's really a, a mishmash. It's a little bit of you know surplus, short coded, um, and then also this big, big explosion of mission driven brands and and doing good in the community, being a part of the company. You know, it's not just some small little thing that they do. It's a part of every sale or their whole kind of makeup of their company is they want to do good. They want to flex their muscle. So what we're doing later this year, and I kind of mentioned it, is launching this direct to need model, really looking like a blue apron, like a blue apron, hello fresh thing, a box insulated with products in it delivered straight to someone's door, a family that we know a family where we understand what the needs are, where we're communicating, there's a relationship there. And this is a way not only to get healthy food and drink into someone's home, and we are going to be leaning healthy, definitely, um, but also another, a way to bring in other resources. Um, you can bring in anything. Um, so we're going to be able to own that real estate in someone's home and have that relationship where it's going to start off with yogurt cups from Chobani. It's going to start off with bars from Kind. But it could it could grow to a much larger um, type of initiative where it's we're we're challenging all these old attempts to solve this issue. Even the language can be challenged. The need, the relief, the insecurity, all that we want to throw out and really reimagine this whole thing. You know, when we when I think about it and when you know, because a, a huge part of this whole operation is plugging in with manufacturers. You know, I mean. The way that we're solving and we think can be revolutionary with feeding families, it only goes as far as, as we have a huge supply of product and we have great relationships with brands and understanding what they're sitting on and how we can pick up sometimes from d distribution centers or brands can get to us. Um, how would we scale this model? We know we can scale it quickly with signing up families, but again, routing product around is really tricky. And this is, is a reason why this doesn't exist. Um, there's a reason why maybe Meals on Wheels is the closest example of a direct-to-door delivery. So logistically and working with brands, there's a lot of hurdles, but from what we know, what we've heard from the 350 companies we've signed up for uh, this pilot program and beyond is that this is desperately needed. An efficient way to pull stuff from field marketing or from some factory floor in Georgia and make sure it makes an impact and that the brand knows where it's making an impact. If they want to be, if they're a mission driven company, they can actually articulate who they're feeding and when and how. And it's, it's, it's a company that's very transparent. It's very efficient. It's definitely driven by data and that re the relationships that we build, the data that we collect from families, that's going to make us an extremely efficient um, plug into someone's supply chain. But I think going forward, you know, we're going to start with this pilot program here in New York. Um, we've got a couple different, really our means test is subsidized housing here in the city. So we're going to be starting with a couple different NYCHA developments, signing on 500,000, 2,000 families and getting this off the ground. We know we can scale quite quickly. We know the brands that we have 
partnered up. There's a lot of products sitting around and we can be in a very, very effective way to make sure that nothing gets tossed. Um, I, I, not a lot of people talk in nonprofits about disruption. I really, really believe that this time we need to disrupt this model. I hate to be an enemy against Feeding America. I think they do a lot of great work, but at the beginning we will serve as a complement to the pantry system, but I think this can be an effective full stop solution eventually where we don't just work with CPG, but we do work with the source, like with Neil talking about the source, the farms, the, the original source of where products coming from, we can bring produce into people's homes. But again, that direct to need model, um, I think can really change the game here. And, um, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. We're going to learn a lot starting later this year. It's a huge drastic change from feeding doctors at hospitals, but um, I think that it's gonna be uh, really, really effective. Great, thanks so much for that that deep dive. Um, you you kept yourself busy <laughs> during that, and you're still, I still are in and working on some really great work. Um, Winston, I know that you actually, Bombite is a, a mission-driven um, food business, food related business. And I'd love to hear a little bit more Bombite um, and, and what you've all been up to and, and what you were up to during during the pandemic. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I just kind of piggyback off what Cole and Neil said, you know, in the, we were lucky because I actually took a very long term approach in terms of dealing with COVID, uh, understanding that if, if it was short term, you know, everything will return back to normal, but understanding that, you know, if schools were closed, I think that was the biggest predictor for me was that if schools are closed and they're not going to open back up, then parents would not be able to return to work. And that, you know, most likely we're probably going to be um, entailing, you know, right behind it. I actually laid off most of my employees or furloughed them two weeks before, um, you know, the news came out um, with COVID, just understanding that, you know, we can have them as temp employees, but also skip the line with the unemployment. With that being said, once the restaurants closed, we knew that there was a huge rush in, in terms of everybody's supply chain from, from food from restaurants that were being donated because everybody just needed to purge. And we were receiving about 70,000 pounds in our um, catering facilities. It's actually the home in which we incubated uh, Rethink as well. Um, so we were just processing food and we actually ended up getting trailers to actually store the food because we knew that you know, supply chains were being disrupted from the markets. People were panicking, they were, they were, they were harvesting, they were storing food, um, canned goods, and that that would happen and you know that would probably last them a good two weeks and then just like low income areas we knew that they didn't have the privilege to actually stock up you know mo most likely if you went to flatbush or um, south brooklyn a lot of the fruit stands and grocery stores were still stocked because people could only afford you know maybe 80 to 100 dollars um in, in in terms of um you know advanced buying so with that just understanding that there was sort of that trickle down effect with under, with just farms starting to slow down because restaurants weren't working and just assessing whole what like where are the bottlenecks, where's the supply, and how do we actually process as much food as possible. So we started turning our restaurants. So I have a little tongue noodle shop, which was actually one of the um, first restaurants in New York City to turn into a soup kitchen to provide meals for those in need. Um, and what we did was just utilize their infrastructure and a lot and just cook for community kitchens and because we knew that due to most um, nonprofits and soup kitchens there was a lot not a lot of participation for, from a volunteership standpoint with people just being wary not understanding whether you know um the nature of covid and how it was going to affect um you know basically everybody in new york city and around the world um so we just what we did was just um created safe guidelines for re for our restaurants to work um, but for my catering facility, we turned it into a processing um, facility where we processed about 70,000 pounds of food every day. Um, and then we got trailers to, you know, flash freeze all this food, um, knowing that there was going to be in the long term, if if that this situation was going to worsen, that eventually people were going to need food. Um, but for the time being, I knew the first month uh, we saw that, you know, pretty much it was pretty slow. Everybody was kind of testing out, figuring out where, where everything was going to move towards. And then when we back in like, June and July, that's when we really saw the increasing demand of people just, you know, you know, either not getting paychecks, not going to return back to work, you know, exhausting their, their safety funds. And most of these people that we knew were already um, living below the poverty line, students, um, people that were already displaced, that lost jobs. But most importantly, you know, a lot of um, the backbone of the industry, which is, you know, um, 
you know, a lot, a lot of the illegal immigrants that we've um, that work in our industry that weren't able to, you know, or get a book uh, job under the books, um, and that they were starting to see some of these soup lines. So that's really where we focused on was just how do we kind of flatten the curve with um, with the excess supply of food, but also make sure that we're reaching out to farms to say, hey, what's your supply chain look like? You know, are you guys growing? Are you guys um, are you guys stopping? It's important that, you know, we have a lot of food and once we use that up that, you know, we have a backup. So like local farms like Brooklyn Grange, what we were able to do was subsidize them at cost for, for some of their produce and work with other government programs that gave grants to either create CSAs, um, pay restaurants to create meals. Um, most importantly was that to keep the farmers working because that was important. We knew that we couldn't afford for those supply chains to dry up. Great, that, that's amazing work and also um, stayed really busy. And before, when I first asked you that question, I realized I said, I said, what were you up to during the pandemic? We are still in it um, during, it's not a past. Unfortunately, it is not in the past yet. We're just in a different uh, version or next step of it. Um, what What is the future of Bombay? What is, where are you looking toward was in the next couple of months in, in terms of the work that you're doing and, and your company? In terms of events, you know, we specialize in large farm cooking. So I think, you know, and that we're very nimble and flexible. So, you know, it's really a shell and, and it's uh, it's four white walls with cooking equipment, large facility. So it actually is versatile to, to make change. And what we're actually doing is incubating small um, businesses um, to help produce um, food, CPG products, um, things of, of that nature so that, you know, we can you know, continue to, to, to boost the economy, but also support local growers and, and um, producers to continue to make food. Um, or So for us, um, you know, we understand that the recovery for the events is probably going to be a year or two out and, and maybe even longer, who knows, because a lot of our business is large gatherings and we don't see that um, returning anytime soon. Um, so our focus is actually looking at um, developing new business ideas and supporting new business ideas by incubating, you know, um, Creative creatives to really think about how we can creatively um, pivot um, to solutions that may work similar to what Cole's doing, and um, you know we're in talks with um, various brands and uh, mission-aligned um, CPG products that want to make a change and make a difference. When I look at sustainability, the question at 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 Bombay has always been accessibility. Um, you know how accessible is your product? You know you may have something that's great, but if it's not accessible to uh, most people and and get to the end user then, you know, it's probably not that sustainable for me. And we knew that during COVID, you know, the, the question of plastic was thrown out the window, you know, because of all the single serves that we need to use. So we had to look at sustainability in other areas um, be, beyond the packaging uh, for the temporary being. And then the second was, you know, understanding cultural sensitivity, you know, making sure that the products that we're serving hits the end user that can utilize it because if they're getting things that they're un, un, unfamiliar with, it ends up in the trash which a lot of the things that we've seen in terms of food access um, typically happens is that somebody gets beets and, you know, it's not typically in a neighborhood or in a demographic that eats beets and they, they end up in the trash. So they take it home. So home waste is actually um, is actually pretty, pretty um, prevalent as well. So understanding how do we maximize um, the efficiencies of the usage of the food that we do have and how do we get it to the end user appropriately so that they can find it to um, to be equitable. Great, thank you so much. That that's so a lot. There's a lot that lies ahead. Um, something that I wanted to, to ask you all, and Neil, I know that you, you know, working with Make um, are connected to a lot of different pieces of the process and understanding, you know, the impact that the shutdown on restaurants had on our local food manufacturers and sort of what uh, Neil, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you saw and and you know how where are we now and and what went on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there were, you know, similar, like, just as I pointed out, there was sort of the two supply chains. Similarly, food manufacturers fall into one or both. Um, they either supply to restaurants or to retail. Um, and both, because, and frankly, a lot of that, that challenge rippled all the way upstream. Um, you close down the restaurant, you close down the, the final buyer, or you take away the buyer's paycheck. Um, you know, there's going to be an upstream effect on, on, you know, was the, if the restaurant can't buy, can the 
will the distributor be able to get get it get the business will the manufacturer be able to get it to the distributor and and so forth um but what i do think was and of course you know local manufacturers and local distributors of of ingredients um and uh, and of food products you know did get feel the hit from that of course but I think um, something that a handful of local manufacturers also did was similarly said the buzzword was uh, was pivot. Um, I think a lot of them were able to leverage some of their um, some of their infrastructure and their capacity to you know provide if let's say they had cold storage on site um, that they usually used to to hold some of their ingredients that they that they turned over. Maybe they weren't producing as much, but they were able to use their cold storage for storing surplus that that you know um one of the upstream suppliers had um and and of course you know the i think just by virtue of so many different um different efforts to provide feeding operations to provide meals um to people who needed them i think that was both from the city's end and also you know from from the private sector and from civil society just seeing all of that come together um, different connections were made across different supply chains that may not have existed before. And I think that's probably the, the, the big takeaway about the nature of our, of our food system, um, that having been able to operate and needing to operate on such a large scale, um, it was built for efficiency. It was built for just churning things out, sending them to where they needed to be, but Sometimes that came in conflict with resiliency. Um, it wasn't able to adapt, particularly the large players like the um, you know the the large meat processors, for example. They weren't able to adapt. They weren't able to to shift because they had such large capital investments because they had such large um, processes in place. Um, but I think what a lot of our local New York uh, companies and manufacturers, in particular, have demonstrated that there is an agility that comes with um, with being relatively smaller um, and being able to think quickly and being able to move your operations. And, and, and some of the capital expenses are, are a little tough um, and we can get into that nuance later. Um, but uh, I think there is something to say about smaller being more powerful in cases like this and more resilient. Yeah, Neil, just to kind of go off of that, um, you know, what we saw like in the first couple weeks uh, of, of what we were doing in, in the spring was it was this big collection of like local manufacturers, large, massive companies um, all in CPG that were sitting on all this extra product all of a sudden. But then as you went through that 10 week stretch, the local brands started to drop off because they were able to be so agile and be able to stop production and, and stop just overproducing and overproducing and, and shift what they were doing and not create all this extra product that had to be donated. What we were working with were pretty much exclusively large companies and pulling inventory from DCs across the entire country because they're just sitting on so much. They don't have that. They couldn't be that agile to be able to just stop, pivot, you know, pull back on production. Everything's already made sitting across the country. So definitely, I definitely saw that firsthand seeing brands from that really, really small to even a little bit larger here in New York, be able to kind of quickly adapt and react to what happened and how retail stopped immediately. Um, field marketing stopped almost immediately and they can pivot and kind of focus just on e-commerce and really get very, very clean in their production, not over, continue to overproduce and overproduce. Um, but yeah, being, being able to be agile, that speaks right to the sustainability. Um, when you can't make that pivot that quickly, create a lot of trash, create a lot of extra product that needs to find a home, usually doesn't. And, um, and that's a, a, a sad reality for a lot of these huge manufacturers. Yeah, actually, sorry, I just want to, um, based on what you were just talking about, Cole, um, in terms of switching to e-commerce, I think that was that was a really remarkable thing that even, um, there are very niche supply chains in New York. So, of course, there's, you know, the, the folks that go, the, the suppliers that go to Whole Foods, the suppliers that go to the Sea towns but there's also, you know, there's a very niche uh, Caribbean 
market in East, East Brooklyn and South Brooklyn. There's a very niche um, Asian produce market that even has its own family farms in Jersey and Connecticut and Florida and Honduras family farms, but that like come into very specific parts of the city. Um, and even those were able to pivot in their own way by virtue of their nimbleness and by virtue in some cases of, of being informal. Um, like I remember there was when a lot of the uh, the Chinese grocery stores actually closed down pretty quickly. And, and there was a big concern um, in the city that, um, that uh, communities that usually shopped at these Chinese uh, grocery stores wouldn't have access to food. But a lot of neighborhoods had actually developed, they'd gotten the phone the phone number of the distributor in Maspeth who usually supplied that, that, uh, that grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so a handful of, a handful of uh, families in let's say Elmhurst would get, get together and make large, bulk orders from this distributor that was usually used to selling to um, to uh, to to the grocery store. And that was sort of the informal version of it. But then after a couple of iterations of that, um, there are groups, there's strip large distributors like um, this one in, in I think Sunset Park that pretty much did pivoted to direct to consumer through, you know, e-commerce e stuff. So it was it's fascinating to see how much how much agility and how much creativity there there was. Definitely, and, and Winston, you know, you mentioned, and it's a huge part of what we're going to be doing. And I'm curious to hear how you guys are going to be doing it. I mean, just to kind of like get some inside information. It's you know identifying families and understanding really culturally, you know, some cultural sensitivities or religious. Um, kind of factors when it comes to what food are we delivering, making sure that everything is meaningful. Every product that enters someone's home or, you know, is on a plate is meaningful. Um, that's a huge challenge. And like pantries and brick and mortars, they have the luxury of just, you know, here's shelves and you kind of choose, you let the consumer kind of choose. But when it comes to what we're trying to do, we have to be really mindful of asking the right questions and getting the right feedback. How are you guys doing that? Um, with, you know, getting the right information, asking the right questions. Yeah, I think, you know, most of it is that there's a lot of the work that's already been, um, that has happened, been happening over the decades while I'm working with local organizations. So I think, you know, to be trusted within the communities is that you have to go in with open hands and an open heart to really listen to the communities. Um, to Neil's point about Chinatown, um, you know, I was up in the Bronx, like, you know, connecting with um, some of the local um, community based organizations and restaurants to see um, what the need was there because Bronx is always in need. And one day I was actually driving through Chinatown. And I think this was like the second week of COVID <laughs> and try to get a coffee and I couldn't find one store open anywhere and just realized, like, you know, there is no marquee markets in Chinatown and most of them are seniors that don't have access to technology. So, you know, for me, that that was the first concern and understanding that, you know, looking up local pantries that were open, they were serving peanut butter jelly sandwiches. So like a high pop, um, portion of the population in Chinatown are diabetic and obese. And it's not just the, a large Chinese population, but there's Hispanics and blacks and, and a large Hasidic community that um, need kosher food as well. So, you know, immediately I thought like, you know, we need to get food in here. And, and, you know, um, one of my friends who actually owns SCA market, which I think, Neil, the one that you're talking about pivoted to, um, doing e-commerce and, you know, they were doing delivery and Kevin actually has this surplus of, um, produce that we're able to get at cost or at least subsidized from, from large suppliers to give to restaurants. So the cost of, um, producing the meal only included labor and, you know, break even costs for, for cogs. So we were able to effectively create meals for less than three dollars and fifty cents, and the idea was just like really f about feeding people and, and not making a margin. Um, but we didn't want to break the bank either. We want to make sure that business had a little bit of overhead to survive. So you know, from my restaurants at Little Tong, we were able to get you know a grant that you know just allowed our workers to 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 work and also you know pay a little bit of rent, but make sure that you know we were doing good for the community and you know that spreading that message for restaurants um you know in, in terms of understanding what we needed to do in terms of stepping up at this time and you know uh, instead of restaurants kind of sort of um putting out their hand and just begging for something we need to be resilient because we knew that those policies weren't going to reflect um you know small business owners um you know we got pp pp ppp but to that point you know 
most restaurants were um you know use today's money to pay yesterday's bills so you know for small small restaurants we knew that we were probably 80 to 100k in the hole um so you know to answer your question about you know cultural sense is you just have to be out there and um you know we had a good uh foot team that just really understood the communities um new people by first name basis and we activate local churches because that's where you were able to get accessibility um to to information because most of the people either went to a local church um on a, on a weekly basis but had um, know, known the people that ran the community centers. So they were able to quickly tell us, hey, we need like, you know, it's 50% Asian, 25% Hispanic, you know, um, 10%, um, you know, um, Jewish, and et cetera, et cetera. So that gave us at least, um, you know, a better estimate as to how we can uh, approach um, cultural sensitivity. And then from there, as we started giving out the meal, we started getting feedback. And, you know, I always say, you know, people that receive free things are the biggest critics. Um, so we were able to get that feedback loop immediately and we were able to make changes um, and, you know, just basically source um, other meals, whether it be kosher, whether it be just changing it up, um, you know, whether it was, you know, they needed halal. And then we just started moving a lot of our restaurant partners to actually just using halal chicken so that there was no question about it. Um, so those are some of the, um, you know, various ways in which we, we went about, you know, figuring out how we can better serve the communities because a lot of the communities where we saw from, you know, even from the get food program from the city that, you know, they brought them to the NYCHA buildings and they were untouched because people just didn't want, you know, the quality of the meal wasn't there. And, you know, secondly, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't sensitive to what they wanted to eat. Yeah. Um, thanks, Wynn. think that was, um, it's really important um a important piece of this puzzle um and really just bringing what winston said like about building relationships and being rooted in the community and it's a, and it's also about building trust and there's a lot of out like community outreach that um takes you know is hard work takes a long time and is incredibly important to this work and essential um so that you, like like we've all said the food that is getting distributed is actually usable it's what people need um and, and what they want to eat um yeah. I want One to add, well, go go the, yeah, the quantitative data that surveys show they're important and I think often we focus on numbers but it's just just as important to focus on the quality of data of understanding what a meal means to somebody there's people that need ready to eat food um, that's hot there's people that would take reheatable food and then there's people that actually um, can actually fend for themselves and they actually just need the um, resources just as such as groceries so finding the diversification amongst those all, th all three of those would help us better detail a program that would fit the needs of uh, many people, but also make it more cost effective. Oh, no, garbage. We so. sound went out for a second, but I think we have you back. Um, uh, that's yeah, no, that that's really important. That getting food doesn't just mean a meal. It doesn't mean a can of soup. It doesn't mean groceries. It means something different for everyone. And there needs to be a stream for that to happen um, for all those pieces. One thing I wanted to ask you all before um, we start to wrap up is, you know, a lot of the work that you've done, that you're doing right now is different than what you were doing before. And um, how does the work you're doing now prepare us for the next crisis or we're still in amidst this crisis or the second wave or, you know, how do we prepare and how do we be better prepared um, for these types of things that are happening in the future? Um, so disruptions. One thing um, I actually wanted to, to piggyback on what Winston was just talking about, um, and it ties into your question too, Joanna. Um, I think part of the impetus for, on the city side was it, with regard to the get food um, program was just crap. People don't have food. We need calories. They need calories. Let's get them calories. Um, it was, it was just baseline, you know, survival concern. Um, and, but of course we came around to realizing, Oh wait, maybe if um, an old Chinese woman is getting peanut butter and jelly sandwiches five times a week, I'm going to finish them. <laughs> maybe we should do something about that. Um, but then I think, and this also touches on, on Joanna, your earlier question about local value added um, manufacturing and processing. Um, we realized that these different supply chains within New York by virtue of, you know, again, as Winston was saying, and, and Cole was saying that the, the, the different 
econ uh, ethnic communities and, and cultural communities. Um, one example that, that came to mind here was as the um, as the large uh, meat processing facilities in Dakota and um, Indiana were closing down, we realized that we had a handful of assets in the city and state that were completely untapped. And those were these live animal processing facilities that exist, you know, um, mostly in industrial areas, but also just like there are a handful in Corona here, there's a handful in, um, in Elmhurst and Maspeth. Um, and these are, these are sometimes they're halal, sometimes they're, um, they supply to carnicerias, sometimes they supply to Chinese uh, restaurants. Um, and these are, these are uh, basically small slaughterhouses that source from family farms in Pennsylvania and upstate New York and Long Island. Um, and you order to what you need. And, you know, especially around COVID, there was, there was like fear that, oh, this is, you know, this isn't safe. But I mean, they're regular, they're hyper regulated. And I think the, the, um, there's, there's certainly like an, an optics thing, but I think just the fact that this capacity this processing capacity that was not vulnerable to the same thing that, you know, your South Dakota huge plants were, um, there's something there. And rather than, you know, kill, like euthanizing all the, the pigs in upstate New York or, or um, maybe tap these assets that we have here that we hadn't really been thinking about as part of like the, 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 the main supply chain, um, the first iteration. So I think that's really a big lesson for us that particularly in New York, we have so many diversified supply chains and we need to leverage them better. For me, um, I think, you know, to, to Neil's point, I think the city um, did a tremendous job in terms of stabilizing and just getting nutrients. So um, not a criticism on their part, but one thing that I think we all saw, um, which was evident, is that, you know, we, we've been working with a broken system for far too long. Um, and, you know, we need to improve communication upstream and downstream um, so that we can talk, you know, the same language. Um, you know, for me, I think one thing that we can learn is learn from this is just really thinking about what actually food, the value of food in our system is and why it's so crucial that we need to put more emphasis in development of these programs, whether it's um, lo um, local producers getting up more accessibility um, to better prices, but also really understanding what the, the restaurant community and the restaurant in industry is um, to New York City. Um, we know that restaurants are community centers by default. We feed people day in, day out, and we need to come up with a system and figure out the the very how to fix and actually revamp the antiquated model of restaurants. You know, it's restaurants are the only businesses which making ten to fifteen percent is actually acceptable and and you know applauded. If, if if we took that similar model and actually put it in tech or any other industry, it would be a failure. No businesses would, no investors would in in. in in sound mind wants to invest in a business like that. So, you know, we need to understand the inefficiencies and the cost that's really driving up um, the ability to actually run successful food businesses. And most of it is from, from a logistical standpoint, um, you know, the, the, the overlaying of, you know, of just premiums for, for, um, for delivery, um, you know, the, the, the many touch points that, um, that happens when it goes, when it leaves the farms to, to, to restaurants and suppliers, how do we have more direct? And then understanding how we need to invest in food as, as a culture, um, because we all need it, and and sometimes we take it for granted. So I think it's a it's a wake up call, but it's also a magical time where we can actually see it actually fail, and understand why we need to invest in it. Um, you know, more so now than ever. Yeah, definitely. That that's the weird thing about looking at over these past six months is that it's turned a lot of people that are within food and even outside of food to start questioning the whole system, um, whether it's for restaurants or wholesale or retail or e-commerce, manufacturing, the whole thing. We started thinking like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. We all grew up knowing the problem of food insecurity or these inefficient supply chains a little bit around it. But, you know, for me, at least it now up close seeing, wait, this whole thing doesn't make any sense. A at least in my world, we're just seeing a huge amount of product being produced 
a huge amount being tossed at every stage of the supply chain, even through to the food banks. They're tossing a lot of stuff. And you've got families that don't know where their next meal is coming from or just don't have access to healthy, nutritious products. Even if they have access to products, they're not necessarily always healthy and nutritious. So for me, I mean, I've got some really grand visions, moonshot. I think the whole thing can be reimagined. I think looking at food and how we purchase food through the lens of a nonprofit, I think that is a change. I think that when we talk about food accessibility, I think that grocery stores and retail are the biggest problems in this whole pie. I think they're the ones taking the 50% margin. They're the ones making food inaccessible for families. Also, it's still a brick and still relying on brick and mortar. You got to go up and go buy this stuff. So in the future, I, I think that we can build something that is not only an incredibly effective, resourceful nonprofit feeding the, the you know, families lower in low poverty that can't afford, period. But I think we can do something even grander and turn um, and really create a grocery store, a nonprofit grocery store uh, online only with no profit margin. And I think that I think that is something where when I look to the future and you try to look at future pandemics like this or just in general, how do you start to really change the whole system? I think you we have to find um, a loser in this chain. We need to eliminate someone. There's too many players taking too much of a cut or there's too many people involved in the supply chain moving product from A, B, C, D, E. It's creating too much trash. It's making food too inaccessible. And you see it during these past six months you know, we see it, how it, it, it crashes down. You see manufacturers struggling. You see grocery stores struggling, families struggling. So we got to remove a couple players. We got to consolidate. We got to streamline this thing a little bit more. Uh, more. Um, that's the long term vision for me is, you know, how do we look? If we're going to say that food is a human right, especially healthy and nutritious food is a human right, we got to turn this thing into, we got to look at it through the scope of a nonprofit. Um, and I think the way we purchase food through a nonprofit removes that profit margin. That's just the moonshot. That's the the grand vision. That's what I think this can lead to by establishing this direct to door delivery model, um, first serving the the least among us, and then building off of that. But like I said, I mean it's really interesting. Just over the six months, everyone, and not just in food, everything, putting a magnifying glass to our systems and to how really a lot of it is incredibly inefficient. I mean, it's a lot better here in the United States than in most countries, but still, it's extremely inefficient, a lot of trash, a lot of people not eating well, or, you know, looking at the hospitals and looking at PPE. Uh, it's amazing. And so I think that's the bright spot going through this is that we're, everyone's being a lot more critical in how our systems are established and maintained. And um, I think like all of us at our different angles from the restaurant side, from the city side, from what I'm trying to do with CPG and families, I think we're all going to attack this thing and, and really push this whole uh, area forward, but um, it's been a wild six months, hasn't it been? <laughs> hasn't it been? I mean, just really quick, Winston. I was with Kevin at, at Southeast Market having coffee with him first week of March at Essex Market. It's like that seems like it was ten years ago when you mentioned uh, Kevin. So it's just insane how much has changed. But um, you know, I think there's a lot to be uh, hopeful for with what we're trying to change here. A hundred percent. And I think there's things that we can do in terms of where, how tech can actually attribute to actually helping us solve these problems is, you know, improving transparent, um, transparency and communication. You know, I think we're so modern in, in our technology and, 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 you know, things are so accessible that we can actually get spices from like Africa in like a day. Um, and, you know, we're buying, not utilizing holes, but parts to a hole that creates the excess, but we don't know that there's excess because, you know, everybody's buying that one item, um, yeah. you know, and I think as, 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 as a chef and as a, as a restaurateur and business owner, you know, it's also our responsibility to, to continue to create because when, you know, that one item becomes so popular, it, 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 be, it drives up the price and demand, but we're growing and not utilizing holes. So um, I think, understanding that if we can create some transparency and create some some type of uh, secondary market for some of these products so that it can be better utilized then we can one um you know work more cohesively and efficiently in terms of how we actually feed you know um, people in, in in the us and I'm, I'm hopeful that you know this is actually really gonna um allow people to just rebuild 
but also participate in the in a grant in a grander system that will allow us to work more um, cohesively and in t together and you know to really achieve what we're, we're what we're trying to do is you know build equity for everybody here in the u.s when um point you made about transparency and valuing food um i certainly would not have understood those the depths of those two supply chains that we literally rely on multiple times a day um were it not for for everything that happened um and i think as we go forward and we consider Transparency, part of the reason we didn't know it was because it was intentional to put it out, right? It was, you know, rezone away that manufacturing, that industrial, put that um, that food facility farther away so, so that we don't make a connection between this delicious meal on my plate and its origins. Um, part of making things transparent ought to be, and making us understand the value of all this, ought to be increasing the transparency of the supply chain. Um, and with, with that, I think, comes with an understanding of you know, there's this phrase that really that came up during COVID, which is essential worker. And it made it so clear who this society deeply, deeply depends on. It's everyone at every level of that food supply chain. Um, and I think part of the lack of transparency has been a lack of transparency around who works and who is responsible for us and for, ha for our nourishment. Um, and I think bringing that, bringing those people to the fore um, really needs to be a big part of our conversation going forward as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you all so much. This was a really um, engaging and really important conversation around our local food supply chain and, and equity and how, like, how are we actually feeding people the right way, the equitable way. Um, and so I really, really enjoyed this conversation and appreciate all of your time this evening. Um, I know I was seeing people dip in and out um, of, of watching. So I uh, just want everyone to know that this will be uh, live forever on our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter pages. So um, if you came in halfway or missed the beginning, the middle or the end, um, you're, you can rewatch it at any time. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Neil, Cole, and Winston again. Um, for everyone w watching, this was day six of uh, virtual events celebrating Made in NYC Week, uh, which is our annual celebration of New York City's manufacturing and maker community. We have two more days. Uh, tomorrow is our last day of uh, full live events. Uh, we have two more uh, live, live panels happening. Um, and tomorrow's theme is resilience, recovery, and adaptation. Um, so at 3 p.m. tomorrow, we have a panel around inclusive design and employment for people of all abilities. And then at 6 p.m., we have a panel around manufacturing pivots and industry resilience, where Libby Mattern from of Course of Trade will be moderating a conversation with four manufacturers who pivoted during the pandemic um, to answer the needs of our city and stay resilient. Uh, the, the companies that will be featured are Bednark and Kings County Distillery from the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and then Make Lab and Stitch Room. So all companies who pivoted to make face shields, face masks, hand sanitizer, um, and more uh, to, to support New Yorkers. And so tune in tomorrow at six um, to learn more about their stories. And um, yeah, thank you all. Um, keep celebrating Made in NYC Week with us until Friday. Friday is the last day. Uh, we have virtual factory tours up on Made in NYC Week's website, which you can find at www.madeinnyc.com. And make sure to shop the exclusive Made in NYC online marketplace um, with Uncommon Goods, which will be up for the entire month of October. You can shop local Made in NYC makers and manufacturers. All right. That's, that's all we got. Thanks, everyone. Um, it was a great conversation, and, and have a great night. Thank you, guys. Thanks.